Welcome to this fourth day of uh, the Climate Week of Pension Pro. My name is André de Vos and I will uh, moderate this workshop. And as you can uh, see and hear, I'm doing this in English because our first speaker will talk in English and will present in English. And today we're going to focus on ESG-related issues. Uh, we'll start off with a workshop about innovation in health and, and Jack Torrance, our guest, will talk about that. No obvious relation to the climate, but of course uh, uh, it has everything to do with sustainability and it also relates to several uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, so that makes it very interesting from an investor's uh, perspective. And needless to say, innovation in health uh, is top of mind in, in uh, one and a half year of, of pandemic. Uh, before I give Jack Torrance uh, the floor, I remind the on online audience that uh, uh, you can ask questions through the chat function. Of course, people in the room here can ask questions by just raising their hand. And I'm glad we have people in the room. We're getting back to normal slowly, so we still have a m our main audience is online. Uh, but I'm glad uh, people are coming uh, in person again uh, and we have a real audience. Uh, Jack, welcome. Thank you very glad much for having me. Make it, because yeah, uh, like glad. I said, I was all set on, on you being online. I'm very <laughs> glad you're here in <laughs> person. surprised. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> much nice to have you here. Um, and um, I, I, well, uh, this is the obvious question to start off with. Uh, of course, I'll introduce you Jack Torrance from Bailey Gifford. And like I said, you will do a presentation on innovation and health. And I'm, I'm very uh, uh, eager to hear how you have gone through this last one and a half year with, with COVID and all these things, because this is, must be, uh, be a very uh, difficult year for you, or a hard working year. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I think we've, we've been working hard, but not as hard as many other people have been working, particularly those that we've engaged with, and you know, a lot of the companies that, that we uh, invest in who've been working very hard to overcome the big challenge of the pandemic over the last 18 months. Um, I mean, I don't know about everyone else in the room here or online. I'm certainly finding this slightly sensory overload because it's the first time I've not been on Zoom for a really long time as well. So it's, it's lovely to, to speak to you all in person and, and, and the rest of you that you're online. Um, and I think, you know, as you sort of introduced, um, this is a workshop, so please do chuck in any questions as we go through. But what I want to talk about in a bit more depth is the sort of the theme that's underlying that big change. And I, I know that we've seen a huge amount of change in, in human health through the pandemic and, and the way that, you know, mRNA has become common in all our lexicons, but that, that's only one very narrow strand in a far bigger trend. Um, and, and it's a trend that we're, we're really excited about at Bailey Gifford. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, our pedigree lies in investing in transformational disruption but for the long term. We're focused on the next 10 years, the next 20 years. Um, and so we're probably not the manager for you if you're worried about the next quarter's results. But what we do want to do is find those companies that are driving revolutionary change and then own them for the long term and, and allow them to deliver upon that promise. Um, and so in particular, in the team that I'm in um, on the health innovation strategy, we are focused on the theme of transfer transformation in healthcare and, and in human health. But that's a much broader theme than it might appear at first. And, you know, what sits underneath this is the big changes that are happening in our understanding of biology that are driving within medicine a shift from sick care where you receive a, a, you know, a, a medicine to treat a symptom to something that can allow you to detect a disease far earlier to rece receive a personalised medicine to you. Uh, and that's all been driven by what we'd call the, the biological revolution. And we think we're right at the very start of this. And it's a really big change that's coming our way. And, and to sort of maybe set in context how we think about the scale of this change, I'll discuss some of the, the changes that we've been through already. So, hold on, once I get through that. The steam engine, you might be like, why has this guy got a train on the screen? Okay, bear with me. If you think about the big changes that have happened in our society, they have been driven by technology. So it was indeed the, the age of steam that brought us from the fields and the countryside into the cities. It allowed us to travel long distances. It allowed us to you know, build things that we've never been able to do. That then drove the second industrial revolution with the production of electricity, um, which allowed us to, to mass produce things and allowed us to communicate around the, the world for the first time. And we're now living through the third revolution, which is the digital revolution. You know, the invention of the semiconductor chip has completely changed our lives. 
Um, I'm slightly too young to remember 1977 when the first sort of PCs came out, and if you were sitting in front of your Apple II, it might have been quite difficult for you to imagine a world like now. You know, even an iPhone would have looked like witchcraft at that stage in life. So I think we are at 1977 in many ways in, in some of the technologies um, that, that we look at. But, but when you think about the sort of impact that these big changes have had, you know, the three industrial revolutions that we've been through, it hasn't really impacted our, our health, you know, or we haven't had that same transformational change in how we, we, we treat patients or how we approach healthcare. You know, we still sadly die of cancers, we die of heart disease, um, degenerative brain diseases are still very prevalent. And I'm sure that everybody in the room or in the call will have, have, have had personal um, interactions with those diseases, very sadly. But the good news is that this is changing. Um, you know, even previous re industrial revolutions were about building new things to make our life easier. What, what the biological revolution is about is unpacking the millions of years of evolution that Mother Nature has given us and allowing us to tweak and control and change that. So why is this important? Because imagine if your biology became like configuring a car or building a computer where you could change all the processes in the cell or change the, the components within the cells to build what you wanted. Imagine if getting sick became like, you know, diagnosing a, a plugging into a car computer and diagnosing the issue. You know, you would know exactly what was wrong and then be able to create a cure for exactly that. Also, if you think about, we've been turning yeast and sugar into alcohol for centuries, but that process can be harnessed to solve a lot of the big issues outside of healthcare as well. You know, could we produce all the chemicals, the cotton, the meat, the, and even electricity in time through the processes of synthetic biology that have been driven by this biological revolution, by our, our increase in understanding? So what I'll do is, you know, I talk about a lot about an increase in understanding. And if you think about how our understanding has increased, it's been very much focused in the last 150 years, maybe even less than that. But I will take you back to two esteemed gentlemen on the, the screen here. So Pythagoras and Aristotle, just to set the scene of, of, of how, much, how far we have come and, 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 and why we're able to now make the, the, the sort of suppositions that we can. So one of the first questions that we would have asked ourselves is where do we come from? How does a baby, how is a baby made? So Pythagoras spent time thinking about it and he came up with a theory of spermism, which is the sperm goes around the male body and it collects all the information about how a human body is made and then it's given to the woman to grow the baby. It took 200 years for Aristotle to figure out the one major flaw in that. How do we get female children? If all the information comes to the male, then this cannot possibly be true. And as absurd as this might seem, if you consider the tools that they had at hand, even that, it was pretty advanced. But let's think about now and the light switch that we've been able to turn on. Okay? Maybe a dimmer switch that's been getting turned up slowly is more accurate. But the microscope for the first time allowed us to see and understand all the microorganisms that drive everything that goes on within the cell. Um, and, and, and now, you know, we're able to, to, to see in such granular detail what goes on inside the cell and then tweak and control and change that. Um, and as technologies improve, this has become like a Cambrian explosion within biology. Uh, and we can now see the cellular machinery and how different proteins interact with each other. And this has led us to a far better understanding of biology. So the sort of foundational step forward that has happened in the last 20 years has been the ability to sequence the genome. So 20 years ago, when we first did this, it was a state level effort. It cost $100 million to sequence one genome and took 13 years. You can now do this today for, in 48 minutes for about $700. So, so why is this important? Because it allows us to read the code of life and we think in time this will become as cheap as a blood test, and it's already on its way there. So, if it, so this technology allows us to, to build an infrastructure for that personalized medicine that I was discussing before. And, and if Illumina have been in charge of bringing down the cost of sequencing the genome that dramatically, then new companies like 10X Genomics, for example, are striving to increase the resolution at which we can sequence and understand what's going inside the cells. So if you look at the individual cell level, we can now take a healthy cell and compare it to a disease cell and spot in the code what it is that's driving that disease. 
And, and that allows us to then start to treat it. And the things that have started seeping into our vocabulary of mRNA is one of the, the processes that takes advantage of that. And indeed, we're getting very close to a future where we'll be able to switch them off or to modify them or to then instruct the genes to then to, to produce what we want them to do and to provide us protection or provide us a treatment or to deliver a, a mechanism to, to do all sorts of wild science fiction ideas that we never thought possible before. But this is just the beginning. There's far more wonders to come from this revolution. And we think that these could have a tremendous impact on society and mankind. This is just one small strand in a huge you know, wave of innovation that's been happening over the past three to five years. And we think over the coming decades that the impact from our understanding of biology is going to be like the internet of the 20. 20s, 30s, and 40s, in how it changes our day-to-day -day lives and allows us to live far longer, far healthier, um, and, and far, more, uh, far more cheaply as well. Jacob, if I may interrupt you, a yeah. question of, for my personal interest. When, I, uh, when this first uh, was possible, uh, there was a lot of optimism about how soon uh, new medicine uh, would come out uh, uh, once we knew once we could uh, sequence every genome, but it, 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 people found out that it was a bit more difficult than <laughs> that. Uh, are we on like a kind of breakthrough here, or is it, uh, it will it keep on uh, be struggling to to this finding these medicines that actually can use this information? So I think what we would say is, you know, that the, 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 the great challenge of biology is is an infinitely complex, but. We're only just being able to understand that complexity. And, and one of the most exciting things about this is that every innovation unlocks a new door, if that makes sense. And so in terms of what this could be applied to, we do think we're at a sort of paradigm shift moment. You know, we've seen a vaccine built in two days that is, it's not actually, it's not a drug, so to speak, in the strictest form. Mm -hmm. It's a set of instructions to your cell to produce the drug in your own body. To my mind, that's still something that's like Star Trek. You know, yeah. it's, it's completely science fiction. But we're doing that now today. And we're doing that in, in the vaccine space. But think about, you know, um, I was lucky enough to speak to the CEO of Moderna two weeks ago. And he was talking about the possibility of delivering, using mRNA to deliver a therapy that could change 25% of the liver cells in your liver into pancreas cells so that you could cure somebody of diabetes. You know, or delivering instructions to build an antibody within the cell to then go after and, and aggressively hunt and destroy cancer cells within the body. So we are getting, you know, within the next three to five years, we think we're going to start okay. seeing these personalized treatments that harness the power of your own body and your own biology and turn you into a drug factory in, mm -hmm. in many ways. And, and that's going to broaden out enormously from just the, the vaccine space. Okay, yes. Thank you. Cool. Um, so I suppose the other, the other obvious question when we're at a investing forum like this is how do we invest in it and how do you think about investing in it and um you know one thing i would say about us at billy if it is we 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 take a slightly different approach to this um you know many investors fear uncertainty we are, we embrace it there, we think that there's no way to accurately completely predict the future but what you can do is make you know try and find those companies that you think have the best chance of of delivering that future and then invest in them early and, and hold them through the ups and downs of their journey to delivering it and becoming hopefully some of the biggest companies in the world as they, as they cause this disruption. And the beauty of doing this in equity investing is that your risk is, that your downside is capped. You know, it's capped at 100%. And sometimes we will get it wrong and we'll make mistakes. But when we get it right, we can get it very right. And the upside is, is unlimited, as you'll see in the, the graph on the top right there. Um, the biggest risk for us as investors, we feel, is missing out on those companies that are delivering the future and not owning them early enough and not, and not being with them for that journey. Um, and also, we think one of the other biggest risks is selling out too early, it is, it is thinking it can't possibly do more than 10 times or 20 times. And, and our, on our experience over the last 30, 40 years as a, an investment firm has very much been that there are all these companies, and when you find them, you want to continue to hold them to, to deliver these outsized, amazing outlier returns. Um, so what I'll do is probably then move on now to a little bit about sort of our team and, and how we generate ideas, or how the team works within the firm, and then how we generate ideas and, and come to them. So within the core of this onion is, is, is my 
you know, who we work for as part of the team, this is the three portfolio managers um, supported by a team of, of three analysts. And so Julia, Marina and Rose have been uh, our joint decision makers on, on the strategy um, and have equal weight in that decision making. The other thing that's really interesting about them is their very different personalities that allows us to invest in this space. So Julia is an optimist. She is the, what can this company become? What is the blue sky potential of it? You know, she'll often go away to visit a company or come back from a trip and be like, this is going to change the world. Um, then Marina's our philosopher. She's academic. She sort of ties it back to the process, gets a bit more rigorous and digs into the background of it and, and has been really vital in ensuring that we've, we've, we've developed this, this process that allows us to find and invest in these companies. And then Rose is the pragmatist. She's the opposite end of the scale. Rose will be like, well, I understand your excitement, but where is it now? You know, how is it financed? How are they going to get there? And how are they going to deliver upon this promise? And the three of them interacting and, and the often quite animated debates that we have as a team uh, allow us to own these companies in the, the concentrated portfolio that's required in order to be able to invest in that asymmetric way. Um, and then within the wider firm, one of the other things that makes this a little bit different is we share everything. There's no star managers. You know, we, we're teams of teams. And um, we have a really positive relationship with, with the people in our advisory group, so that core team around us who we meet with every four to six weeks. Um, and probably the most important one to highlight on that page is the relationship with our private companies team. So about 25% of their holdings are in healthcare space, and we lead a lot of the research there. Even though we can't invest in private markets, it allows us to get to know those companies two, three, four years before they list, so we can build our conviction. Um, and, you know, one of the, the sort of famous example for us was we first met Moderna back in 2016, uh, which allowed us to then invest at IPO, and we've been long-term shareholders um, for them ever since. Do you go to the companies or do you also go to the universities? Because a lot of companies are, of course, connected to universities. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, it's an, a nice sort of segue to the, the next slide, which is what an, our other big differentiator, we think, is our, our ecosystem that we exist in. And we think it's really important as investors to be active in that ecosystem, to make those connections, to build out that network. You know, we come at this as experts in the businesses that can deliver the future, but we need to be able to go to and, and, and understand where the future is coming from at the earliest phases. So as a firm, we sponsor, you know, a lot, we have a lot of relationships with academic institutions. We sponsor PhDs. We also have strong relationships with those entrepreneurs and those thought leaders who are building these companies at the earliest phases and it's that access and thinking in, in that space and, and, and those conversations that we have in that space which are particularly fruitful in helping us guide our vision of the future. Um, and, you know, we also have the, are very lucky to have those relationships with some venture capital and private equity funds that think like we do. Um, flagship pioneering is one that, that immediately springs to mind who we work with quite often. Um, but, this is a very important thing for us because what we don't believe you can do is hire in-house all the best minds in the world. So why not build a network that allows you to leverage them? And an example of how this works in an investment case, you know, I would perhaps talk about Grail, which is a subsidiary of Illumina. So Grail are an amazing company. They're developing a single draw pan cancer test. So you, you pull some blood out and then you can test it for the earliest biomarkers of, of a cancerous cell, which could completely change how oncology works. Mm -hmm. When they first announced that they were going to do this, it was met with a lot of scepticism by experts. But we saw the sort of potential of, of what it could be. And, and we were able to build our conviction in the science by going to speak to some of our other holdings. So from not too far from here, Genmab, who are, are building antibody treatments uh, for cancers, and said, well, you know, how does this fit with what you're doing? How would this make what you're doing e you know, work better? Um, we also went across and spoke to um, some of the leading academics at U.S. medical schools, um, who are about you know, leading oncologists, about you know how realistic is this? This is what they say they can do, and and that allowed us to really build that conviction in the science. Which then, when it was combined with our excitement about the culture at Grail, about the management team at Grail, about their credentials, and their ability to deliver upon that promise, um, was was what made it you know easier for us to then invest. Um, and it's now come back into Illumina, uh, which is. You'll see it as in the portfolio later on. But yeah, this for us is, is the real difference. And this is what we think is very important to do as investors. Great. So we've taken all that information from the world. We've been out, we've been out visiting companies. We've been speaking to you know, the entrepreneurs that are building these tiny companies. We've been speaking to the scientists who are discovering this new stuff. So how do we make a decision on whether or not we're going to invest? 
One of the difficulties of investing the way we do is that when you're thinking about what a company's going to look like 10 years from now, the numbers and backward-looking data often aren't that useful or that, uh, you know, when you're thinking about evaluation. Valuation is the heart of what we do, but we think the quality of factors give a much better indication of, of the value of the company, particularly over the next five to 10 years. And so we kind of split this into thirds, and this is the, the repeatable, robust process that we put any company through, and indeed will revisit through time as things change within that company. So the first third is focused on what does this company do, and why is it better than what exists already? What we're investing in is in revolutionary change. It's not a drug that's marginally cheaper it's not an extension of life by three or five months. We want people who are finding cures. We want people who are going to enable patients access. We want to be able to give those companies that are going to spread the advances that are happening now across the world a chance, and we want to be able to own them. And so that first third really helps us build out our, the opportunity that the company has ahead of it over the next five, 10 years. The second third then focuses on the culture and the management of the company, which we think is very important in delivering upon what's been identified in the first third. You know, what is it about them that's going to make them maintain relevance in the future? What is the breadth of their opportunity? How many different things can you apply this innovation to? We don't want a one-trick pony. We're not investing in a single drug, and we want to move away from that binary mindset. You know, and we think that the culture of a company is also very important, particularly in this space. Without a focus on patience and without a focus on fundamental science, one of, the, one of the most difficult things and one of the sort of bottlenecks within this space is human capital. And you will not be able to find, attract, and retain the scientists who, who, who you need to deliver what your company can do. So culture is a hugely important part of any company, we think. Um, and then that leads us into the last part, questions seven to, to 10, which is, is where we then root the opportunity and we root the culture and management in where it is now. So what we want to see is how is this company financed? How realistic is their vision of the future? How do they allocate capital? Do they spend lots on R&D? You know? um, and we, what we look for as a minimum is can this company deliver two and a half times growth from where it is now over the next five years? And that growth pathway must be maintained throughout our period of ownership. And if at any point we believe that that's waning, then that would, would lead us to, to make a sell decision. The other one then is the potential to become an outlier. Can this be the biggest company at what it does? Or could it be one of the biggest companies in the world indeed? And that helps us build conviction in those companies where maybe the two and a half times isn't so clear where they're much earlier stage, but where the opportunity ahead of them is enormous. And one that immediately springs to mind, and sort of one of my favorite companies is Denali, uh, which is a, a US-based company that's trying to solve or produce a delivery mechanism for drugs to the brain. There's been zero progress on degenerative brain disease for the last 35 years. So, and the key obstacle to that is getting drugs through the blood-brain barrier. So if they can find a way to do that, which is looking increasingly like they will, then we could start to tackle dementia, Alzheimer's, and some of these big, big diseases. But, but how easy or how difficult is it to predict uh, whether a company can deliver? Uh, because uh, they might have very promising results in, in, in uh, lab tests, but in mm -hmm. the end they're going to uh, have to test on, on patients. I think that's the phase three, yep. uh, ultimately. And, and you see very often that somehow it goes wrong there. Uh, we have in the Netherlands, of course, Galapagos, mm -hmm. a company you know. Uh, very promising for a long period of time, but uh, uh, the, the, the last uh, test with patients were uh, disappointing. They didn't get approval. So I, I, I would think it's very difficult to have any idea whether they can can deliver? I think that's an interesting way to look at it in some ways. And I, I know I used the word binary earlier, and I think that's a way that most people will think about this space. You know, it's either all in and win, or it doesn't work at all. But what, if you focus on finding those very rare companies that are delivering, are, are producing an innovation, and you know, specifically in the biotech space, that can be applied to lots of different applications. So, you know, uh, GEMAB with monoclonal antibodies and applying them to lots of different cancers, or Moderna's mRNA technology, or Al Nylum mm -hmm. with uh, gene silencing RNAi. Because once they have proven it once, you know, and once they get that first success, that then significantly de-risks further application. Okay. And so it's that question four, you know, it's the remaining relevant in future. So it's, it's being able to take the innovation, iterate on it, and then apply it far more broadly to lots of different mm -hmm. diseases. And that's what we want to invest in. Um, and, and there's not many of them. 
So when we go to the portfolio slide ne next, you'll see that you know we don't okay. have a, we don't have a lot of them. Yeah. Um, but you know I think the, the important thing of this is it, this is applied to the company throughout its period of ownership, and we don't just do it once. So that that growth pathway for us is something that must be maintained. Um, and actually, sorry, before we get on to the portfolio, another thing that is very vitally important is just to highlight how we think about impact within that space. And I know I've talked a little bit about it already, but you know, we've been recently been joined by my colleague Maria, Maria who's sitting in the front row uh, from the UN. Um, he's helping us develop further our impact framework, but it's embedded in our philosophy. It's vital to everything that we do in terms of becoming owners of companies. We, it's, it's, it's understanding what they do, why it's different, why it's better, and also focusing on patient centricity. But, but it's something that's evolving for us. And we don't think impact is about just turning cells on a spreadsheet green and, and making people comfortable with it. It's about being active with companies. It's about helping companies become better, increasing access to their innovation. It's about encouraging them to behave in, in, in better ways. And you know, and that, so you can focus on all those good companies, but there's also a lot of work to be done by finding those companies that aren't behaving that well and making them behave better. Um, and so we'd see it as sort of two, two columns of being direct, having direct impact. You know, we've provided primary capital to companies before and something we'll, we'll continue to do. We facilitate access through our ecosystem by connecting the companies with each other. So Argenks, which is just down the road in Belgium, we connected with the Xilabs to get them into the Chinese market. Um, we want to continue to influence policies. We want to use Maria to help us engage with NGOs, engage with governments. Um, and we want to encourage companies to, to make their products more accessible. And then indirectly, inherent in this space as well, is that with investment success comes success for patients. Because if you're finding companies that are delivering big changes, big cures, then when your companies do well and their share price does well, then you also do very well for, for mm -hmm. people more generally. Um, so I'll jump onto the, the portfolio to talk about you know, the very few companies. And I, I did stress it was very few companies. So we can have between 25 to 50 stocks in the portfolio. But for us, this is the best 40 companies that are delivering the biological revolution at present. And I know that I've got nice buckets across the top here, but that's not how we think about it. That's, we invest across the full value chain of healthcare. And whilst there's still a bias at the moment in the center around the treatments with the clinical drugs and devices, we think that's because it reflects what the current state of healthcare is. You know, it's still a sick care system. It's giving generic um, treatments to, to symptoms. But as we go through time, and we've already seen it, it's starting to spread out and we're getting a far more preventative type of medicine where we can detect diseases far earlier and then develop personalized cures for patients. And that's all been driven by this understanding of diseases, understanding of what goes on within our cells that we've never had before. So I'm very happy to take any questions on these at the end. Yes. We'll, 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 well, are there any questions here in the room already? Or, we, or maybe, yes, please. Yes. Do we have a microphone? You can also wait until the end. It's not okay. about this part particularly. Okay, well, okay, well, now you're getting the microphone. <laughs> so my question is just in uh, general. It's not about the portfolio in special, so we can wait until the end. Okay, okay. 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 Well, yeah. well, I'm almost done now anyway. Yeah, so so, yeah, well, up I, the... I got lots of questions too, okay, so great. I'll be getting questions in as well. So I think this is the sort of last bit, which is marking our homework. We are just reached our three-year track record, um, but we, we don't want to be judged on that. This is a, a five-year-plus fund, so... You know, um, whilst it's been pleasing to see that our process that we've been working on and developing over the past five, six years is, is working, and ultimately we've, we've now brought it to clients in the last 18 months, um, we are really looking to, to perform, outperform over the long term, and, and that's how, how we want to be thought of. Um, so with that, I'll sort of close our, our presentation, and, you know, I hope that this idea of, of where we're going and this big change that is happening and the impact that that can have, you know, and I know I focused on healthcare, but the understanding of what's going on with inside us and inside ourselves can dramatically change all aspects of our life. I think our experience as patients will dramatically change. We'll go away from getting sick, seeing a doctor and receiving a pill to being continually screened to then receiving a medicine that turns us into a drug factory that, that protects us and then goes after those things that are going wrong with inside our bodies. Okay. So, great. That sounds like a very <laughs> interesting perspective for the next couple of years. So yeah. we'll go to the question you want to ask. Uh, maybe state your name also before, because then we know. Thank you for the presentation. My name is uh, Annie. Um, yeah, I've got a question because you are talking about like a preventive kind of medicine, mm -hmm. but already when there is a diagnosis, so in the beginning stage, I, I think. 
So I think that how we think about it at the moment now is when when you get when do you go and see the doctor? What would ha what would make you go and see the doctor? When you have some sorry, my English not perfect, no, yeah. but where you have some complaints, is that yeah, good? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So we're talking about a world where it goes before that. So imagine that you know gene sequencing becomes as cheap as a blood test, and at yeah. birth you sequence your genome and you understand what could go wrong for you in future and what you're genetically predisposed to have you know and so i'm scottish and irish so heart disease front of mind um but then you look at a company like verve therapeutics that could well, diet, diet has changed from fish and chips uh, yeah, decades, yeah. Well, hasn't it's it? more, <laughs> slightly. we're getting there I, I think i'm more aware of it now okay. but like verve therapeutics which is working on switching off the gene that causes the production of cholesterol mm -hmm. so you know in theory i could regardless of my lifestyle have a very basal chance of, of developing a heart attack or having a cardiac um, cardiac disease through time because we can switch off the gene that, that causes the, the root of that because we've, we're able to understand what's going on inside the patient. Equally, I talked a little bit about Grail. You know, to be able to get a blood draw um, once, twice a year that can spot cancer cells very early on. I mean, you'll be probably be surprised to hear that we all have cancer once, twice a year sometimes. We're producing cancer cells, but our immune system goes after it. And it's only when our immune system can't, either can't see it or, or can't overcome it that it becomes a tumour and then becomes an illness. So being able to spot that early and then deliver, a, I don't know, an antibody treatment, for example, that, that, that trains your immune system, and this is, this is me simplifying it hugely, so I'm aware of the scientists in the room. Um, you know, it trains your, your immune system to, to, to set the, the sort of police cells after it and destroy those cancer cells could be completely transformative. And we've already seen that in cancer, that early detection. The cancers where we're aware of what we're looking for, you have a much higher survival rate. But if you think about the cancers that are more difficult to detect, bladder cancer, ovarian cancer, the, the, there's still very, very low survival rate. And that could completely change that. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Jack, I, I was uh, wondering, uh, I already asked that at the beginning, but I would think that that the 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 uh, corona pandemic has really uh fastened the pace of innovation mm. Mm. uh for instance uh in the netherlands has been a, a big discussion about uh, uh a genetically genetically modified organisms uh being practiced in medicine yeah but with the vaccines we are now having that discussion seems to have disappeared what do you think will be the effect for the next couple of years on the innovation in the health sector in, in general? So I think in general, the pandemic has been really instructive in demonstrating a couple of things. So the first would be the, the scope of the change that's required. So if we look at it as how we've responded sort of operationally, there's a lot of change required in, in making healthcare more efficient, more accessible and, and pushing out and, and, and being able to diagnostics, you know, and uh, would have made things work much quicker. That's one area, and there's lots of amazing companies working on doing that. But I think the second, probably more exciting area, is the acceleration of, of development of drugs as well. You know, we saw how quickly that when it became a focus that you can develop something. Um, I think the Moderna one was amazing because they, before COVID, they were working on uh, a vaccine for something called CMV, which is a, a virus that's present in about 70% of us. And they were developing this, this way to do it completely automated and, and using um, AI to help design the drug and, and then build it. So when they got the first mapped genome of the virus, they received it as an email. I think, it was a, I think he even said it was an Excel spreadsheet with sort of ones and zeros. It went into the machine and then 15 minutes later, it produced the, the recipe, if you will, for the, the vaccine that we have. Yeah. So it took 15 minutes. Yeah, it took them two days because they wanted to check it because they were like, this is a, the stakes are high here. We need to check this. And mm -hmm. they checked and checked and checked and then put it into production. Um, and then ultimately it was the trials that then took all the time. Um, and so when you consider that that's how we can now develop drugs and you know, also the big steps forward that are happening in AI in terms of um, being able to model drugs in silica, it means that by the time you then build a biologic drug and introduce it to a person, it's got a much higher chance of success. Um, so there's a, a great, really cool UK company that we, we've very recently invested in. I think they IP'd on the 1st of October. Um, and again, cautious and Maria is a biologist, but the way I'd explain it is a bit like, imagine you're designing an F1 car and you want to see which body shape's most efficient. Rather than building thousands of polystyrene models and putting them in a wind tunnel, you build it in a computer model and then you see how the wind moves over it. Yeah. You can do that now with molecules. So you build a molecule and then you model how it will react within the body. So before you've actually built any drug, put it anywhere near a mouse, a monkey or a person, you can radically increase the chances that that will be successful. 
Um, and that is going to dramatically change the speed at which we can, we can make medicines. And it will allow us to, to scale that personalization as well. So we think that in itself is really, really exciting. It's going to dramatically change things. Um, and I think that the final thing that the, that the, the pandemic has changed is it's now front of mind for us, you know, that infectious diseases pose a, a serious threat. You know, it's, it's almost a national security threat. And we need to become much more resilient. Mm -hmm. um, and governments are now much more aware of this resilience in you. And we need to also increase access to it. We need to be building plants or production facilities outside of developed markets. We need to be able to provide that flexibility and that reaction across the world because we don't know where the next one might start. But do you think that, the, 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 of course, uh, this will... There was a sense of urgency with the vaccines against COVID, but mm -hmm. do you think that, that this will last? Because uh, now we have the pandemic under control, we will get back to the normal regulatory uh, testing and it'll go, it will slow again. And uh, for other medicines for, that are, have less urgency, yeah. it will take more time again. Or do you think this will somehow let regulators have learned that, that maybe they were too strict in allowing things or? So I think that the important thing to highlight is that the regulation pathway that they went through was exactly the same, but as you say, it accelerated because of the urgency. But, what, you know, as I've talked about before, by being able to build with a much higher chance of success a biologic drug before it goes to trials, we think that will help speed up significantly. So that ability to model in AI, in silica, those drugs, could help reduce the amount of time. Um, I think in terms of, you know, the other thing to remember about this sector and this theme is, that ev almost everything that's focused, particularly in drug development, is focused on saving lives. And so there's a, a great deal of urgency to it. And, and we think that hopefully the, the way people's perceptions will change, and, and particularly regulators and government's perceptions will change to help keep this accelerated pace going. Um, and also, I think the promise of a lot of the this new medicines or this new type of medicines starting to be seen and starting to become more prevalent in clinics and, and, and patients will start seeing the benefits of it more, which will dr drive that demand and drive that, that change to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, you know, in, in my personal view, I think it's such an exciting time to be involved in this and to be seeing what these companies are doing. And I think that, you know, governments world, around the world are, are waking up to it, whether you're in the US with lots of multi-payers and the financial pressure of their insurance system, but also within Europe with our single payer, you know, our, our state provided provision, the, this new way of medicine can make it so much cheaper. It can reduce the pressure on um, medical staff. It can reduce pressure on infrastructure. Because if you can prevent a disease before it becomes an issue, you save hundreds of thousands, if not millions, on very expensive medicines. Yeah. If you can treat patients at home remotely by connecting them to the cloud with various devices, then that's a patient that's not in the hospital that doesn't need nursing. You know, you can reduce the burden and you can have a much higher, better quality of care. Well, it's interesting that you say, uh, what well, you bring up the cost for society, because that, that is, of course, a major discussion. Uh, but somehow the discussion seems to be, or uh, was before Corona, uh, that the society was complaining about uh, the very uh, expensive medicines that all these new companies mm. were bringing out. Mm. Uh, and... and uh, uh, there was also the discussion about why are they asking these kind of prices if maybe the intellectual property is maybe state-owned already because it yeah. was developed at, at universities. How do you see, of course, from an invest, investor's uh, perspective, it's very interesting if you have a company uh, that makes high returns on medicines, but mm. uh, say from the social perspective, and we are here on a ESG uh, no, uh, conference, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you look at this dilemma? Uh, very profitable companies, but maybe not so. Well, the, the, maybe the medicines are too expensive because they have like a monopoly on, on this medicine. Yeah, no, I think that's a very valid point. And, and there is a tension there. And there will always be a tension between rewarding those who've taken the risk to develop a drug and, and, and create it between the societal benefit. And, and that's something we were very alive to. But you know, you'll notice when we had the portfolio slide up there, there wasn't any big pharma companies, and that's very deliberate because that isn't the, the type of behaviour that we're interested in. What we want to, you know, and and if you think about that shift to the more personalised, preventative form of medicine, the drugs that, that are produced to to enable that shift and to enable that are inherently cheaper than the the, the curative drugs, the ones that you you have to take when you're sick or mm -hmm. to treat the disease after you've gone point past that point. Um, you know, and, and also I think that there's... So would you leave those uh, companies out of your portfolio? Yes. 
Okay. Yeah, so we focus much more on the, the, the companies that are driving this change. We want the companies delivering the change mm -hmm. and we want the companies that are moving us to that, that more uh -huh. preventative yeah. type. And so you'll see within those holdings that that's what we're focused on. But however, it, it's not as clear as that. It's not black or white because you do need, you know, for Big Pharma has a, has a huge role to play, but we think that their model is going to have to significantly change. Um, and we think also as medicine becomes more personalized, the benefits of scale will be reduced significantly. Mm -hmm. You know, do you get questions like this from investors, like institutional investors like pension funds, say the ethical dimension of investing in certain companies uh, because they are charging high prices? Mm -hmm. There might be any good reason for asking these prices, but mm -hmm. still it's a bit awkward if, if you're, say, a pension fund for the, for the health uh, to invest in a company yeah. charging high prices. No, I completely agree with you, but then I think that's why it's so important in our role as investors to help change this behaviour. Mm -hmm. Because we, you know, as, as, as shareholders, and particularly when you're significant shareholders in the companies, can, can really change their behaviours. Um, and, and, and also, yeah, so, so we, do, we do play a huge role in that and in changing the landscape. There's still a lot to be done, and I think the way that drugs are developed at the moment is set to, to really change. Um, and it will become cheaper to develop drugs that will help deflate the, the, the prices. You know, drugs will be developed for the individual um, and, and done in a way that's repeatable and automated, which will again help deflate prices. Mm -hmm. um, and it will just, we, we, our hope is that then the, those deflationary forces are, that are acting on the, the marketplace will also then help increase access. It will make mm -hmm. it cheaper and, and more easy for, for people, not just in Europe, the US, but around the world to be able to access this innovation. We have to make prevention a business model. Yeah, and I, but I think we're, we're getting there. We're getting towards that. Um, and. And, and things have to change. We can't continue the way that we are. And, and I think that's probably a sentence you're going to hear from a lot of your speakers mm -hmm. um, this week. But the current system is working, but it's creaking. Um, and, and this is a solution through technology, through the convergence of all these exciting new technologies to that problem. Um, and, and what we think is really exciting as investors is we're helping to drive that adoption and helping to drive that disruption. Um, and I, th I think that that's a really positive way to look at it and think about it. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions here in the room that haven't been asked yet? This is your chance. Alvin back there. Could you state your name, please, before you ask? Thomas van Kuipers. Um, your story is really about, uh, let's say, the biological medical um, uh, side of uh, healthcare, which is really important. But I remember um, Michael Porter, when he was in Rotterdam uh, School of Management, he was also focusing a lot on the organizational part. Mm. And he highlighted that, uh, especially Edith Schippers, uh, the former uh, minister uh, in the Netherlands on that part, uh, she, that she improved a lot on that part. How do you see that uh, combined with what you're telling her? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. And, and I think, you know, I've, I have focused in on quite a sort of... Or, on an area and maybe talked about it with the examples of, of, of the biological stuff, but the operational side is hugely important in healthcare. It's, um, if you think about the constraints that are on in place on, in a hospital, for example, so a doctor takes minimum seven years to train, a nurse takes three or four years to train. So how can we help them become more efficient? How can we help them spend more time with patients and less time filling out forms? Or you know, how can we increase the, their, their reach? You know, telemedicine is a great example but equally, there's a lot of devices and um, that are connected through the cloud that can, can help that, that reach. So one that jumps to mind immediately for me is um, Butterfly Network, which you might not be familiar with, which is, uh, so they put an ultrasound on a semiconductor chip and it plugs into the bottom of your iPhone, connects to an app, and then you know, someone as, uh, like my, me can then use that to, to diagnose using ultrasound any part of the body and then send the results up through the cloud to, to a physician. Now, okay, you might think that's quite a gimmick, nice little iPhone accessory, but two thirds of the world doesn't have access to ultrasound. And the ability to look inside the body is one of the fundamentals of medicine. So they produce, you know, one of the machines that if you've ever been for a scan or if you've been a nervous, a nervous partner sitting for a scan, you know, these things weigh 200 kilograms and they cost like $100,000. And you can produce this for less than a thousand and getting cheaper then think about that replacing the stethoscope, thinking about that going into all these areas where people don't have access to that and how that could transform it. So, um, yeah, and, and I think also the other interesting area to focus on is, is that remote monitoring and taking uh, patients out of clinics and out of hospitals and allowing them to live far more normal lives enabled by technology. 
Um, so sort of two companies that spring to mind on that is is, di is in the sp space of diabetes. So if you have a continuous glucose monitor like what Dexcom produce, which is monitoring constantly your insulin levels, and then uh, another company called Lavonga, which is now part of Teladoc, um, will help you manage your insulin levels through lifestyle rather than through taking synthetic drugs, and you can start to wean yourself off the, off, off insulin. So when you are, your blood sugar level starts to drop, it will suggest that you should eat something and what you should eat to bring you back into normal range. Or if you start going hyper, it will say, it's time to do some exercise, go for a walk, help bring yourself back in normal range. And it also makes patient compliance much better because one of the most expensive things with diabetes is constantly having to go to the doctor and then maybe not being that truthful with your doctor about what you've eaten or, or, or what you've been doing. Um, and then them making decisions on your, on your future dosing based on that. Whereas you can track that constantly and the doctor can see exactly what's happening and give you a far more accurate treatment and therefore see you far less. So again, that, that can help it, it hugely. And, and, and that's all these technologies that have come from different fields and from outside of healthcare that have converged into it that are, are driving that change. But, but you're completely correct. The operational side needs, needs to change. And uh, sort of, I'll leave you on this stat which blew me away, which was when we were visiting a company who saw banks and banks of fax machines in their, their factory. And we're like, why is that? dug a little bit deeper and, and it turned out that that's how they had to do all their ordering process. In 2019, 70% of all medical communication was carried out on fax. Now, when we live in a world of email... These are UK numbers, I believe. No, no, no. no. Globally, International? Globally. Okay. Which is, is mind-boggling when we live in a world of email and, you know, and Amazon Prime, you know, makes that very embarrassing. So let's think about how those, you know, that sort of um, model could completely revolutionise um, healthcare from the operational side. Okay. Thank you, Jack, for giving us an insight in, uh, I think, one of the most important uh, uh, economic sectors for the coming years, uh, given the, the, the enormous cost for society of, of healthcare. So thank you very much for your presentation. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me, and, and thank you very much, uh, everybody, for listening. Okay. Thank you. Great. Uh, we, go, we have lunch here, and then we'll be back at... Uh, uh, I think one o'clock, am I right? One o'clock for our next presentation. Thank you for now. <laughs>